Welcome to Applied Materials and Corrosion. Today we're going to talk about re electrode systems and some about corrosion as well. Oops, and I forgot to turn my. Oh, here we go. So let's come over to me so we can talk about it. Takes a little bit of time. Could do it faster. Let's do that. Up to now, we've been using two electrodes, and there's a problem with using two electrodes in that it's impossible to tell exactly how much of the voltage is going on to one electrode and how much is going on to the other. So if we imagine our electrode system, we've got two electrodes, the power supply is connected to, and in between is our solution. And the solution will have a voltage somewhere between the voltage of the two electrodes, probably, unless we provide it with some other electrodes. What we know is that we're pushing the two electrodes off equilibrium, and we know that our power supply will make sure that the number of electrons going into one is the same as the number of electrons that are coming out of the other one, but we don't control the voltage, so we can push the voltage on one up or the voltage on another one up. That is a problem, so what we used, or what I used in the demonstrations, was very high current, effectively, electrodes that are not affected very strongly by the, you know, by the voltage. So the current can be supplied very easily by small change in voltage, and that means that they appear to not change very much. And we also use a reference electrode. Reference electrodes, however, are stable, but not very good at taking a very large amount of current, because then we would use them up. So in the case of the electrode that I used, which was silver, silver chloride, if we start to use up the silver chloride on the surface of the electrode by reducing it to silver, then our electrode potential, the voltage of it, will start to wander around. Again, on the other side, if we use up our silver by oxidizing it to silver chloride, then not only will our electrode fall off because it's all now powder, we also have another problem that we can't oxidize any more silver up, and so the potential then becomes undefined and it then will go somewhere. So a better solution is to have a box of electrics, which does job for us, a third electrode. So now we have a reference electrode whose job it is to measure the voltage. And we have two electrodes, one which we want to know what's going on, and the other one is just the dump for all of the extra electrons, or co to collect electrons from. On that, electron um, on that electrode, we want electrochemistry to happen, but we don't want it to interfere. Let's go back to the board for that. So I've got all my things on there now. I've got this, which is the working electrode, which would be whatever metal we're trying to look at. Maybe it's coated, uh, maybe it's coated in some way, maybe it's not. Maybe we're interested in the test solution. So we're interested in body fluids perhaps, or we're interested in seawater, or we're interested in lake water, whatever we're interested in. That would be up here. In here we need to have our reference electrode on the inside silver, silver chloride on top of it, and then a chloride containing solution. And we want to have some way that doesn't reach our working electrode. So we will have some kind of porous material at the end. It's got very fine pores on it because we don't draw very much current from our reference electrode. Then we can have, uh, we can measure effectively the voltage on our working electrode and we can use our electrics box, which we call a potentiostat, to set the voltage compared to the reference electrode. Then we can draw any current if we want to go to a different voltage, any current that flows on our working electrode to get to the voltage that we want to, the potential. Sorry. Then we will have to dump or collect electrons from the counter electrode over here, and there is another porous barrier here to reduce diffusion. So in both cases, they are allowing, uh, they're allowing ions through, but they are thin and small pores in there so that they don't allow liquid to exchange. And that means we've got a certain amount of time before chloride ions escape from here and start to contaminate our solution, and before whatever ions or other species we're making at a counter electrode diffuse through here and start to contaminate our solution. In some cases, we would have another arm with our reference electrode in it. 
so that we can keep chloride ions away if chloride is a big problem. Chloride is often a problem in corrosion, it's often a problem in other types of measurement, but if we're looking at seawater or blood, body fluids, then chloride is going to be in there anyway, so it's not going to be matter if we're a little bit more. It depends on the situation very much. This red thing here is what's known as a lung piri, and that helps to reduce the resistance between the reference electrode and the working electrode to make it see the voltage of the working electrode and not the voltage of something else. That's only applicable or is only important if we're drawing current between our counter electrode and our reference electrode, so the position here, the voltage isn't the same as near the working electrode. It's sometimes useful, sometimes not. What we need for this course is not how to make an electronics box that's going to do this, but to understand that if we have three electrodes, we can isolate one as our working electrode and we can know more things about it. We can know what the voltage is at it, what the current is at it, and define the processes just at that electrode, which is very useful because, as you will see, there are a lot of things that can happen and we don't want those to interfere with what we measure. In the cases that I've shown before, I've been measuring both at the same time and hiding it by having a lot of current flowing in my combined counter and reference electrode, which was the other one. Now we can go to a proper three electrode system and we will measure the voltage of the working electrode properly using a reference electrode, which is a silver silver chloride electrode. Inside the silver silver chloride electrode is potassium chloride typically. And there is a reason for that. Potassium chloride is less soluble in water than sodium chloride is, and so we can have saturated potassium chloride and it's not super concentrated. The uh, saturation point for potassium chloride is about 3 molar, I believe. So it's not really, really concentrated, and that's good. If it's saturated, the concentration is constant, whatever I do, which is also good. So if a bit of water leaks in here, a few crystals of potassium chloride will dissolve and the concentration won't change. If a bit of solution leaks out, it will dissolve into the solution and the concentration won't change. So that's all good. If it dries up maybe a little bit, some more potassium chloride falls out of solution and the concentration doesn't change. So it's a handy way to keep the concentration constant and it's a handy way to be able to make the solution without having to weigh it too much. You put in a little bit more than is needed and the rest sits at the bottom and does nothing. So we've established that we can turn off and on electrochemical uh, processes at our electrodes when we can oxidize or reduce some chemical species that is either part of the electrode or part of the solution. Sometimes it's part of both. So if we're going to make an iron oxide, it will be made out of oxygen from the solution and iron from our iron electrode. The question is, where does the current come from? And the current is determined by in the simplest case, the size of the electrode. If we have twice as much electrode, we can have twice as much electrons per unit time. But it doesn't hold entirely true, because if we have a very concentrated solution, and our species can get there very easily, then it, it does. If our, if our concentrations are lower, then the things in our solution have to get to the electrode, and therefore we're thinking about processes in the solution which are related to fusion or convection. So if we go quickly back over here, we can see that I've written that down. This is a diagram of our solution, and our solution has little blue dots in that are going to get to our working electrode and are going to gradually get there by diffusion, or they're going to move around by convection. And it depends very much what the size of our electrode is and what the concentration is, which one of these two processes will win. But typically, if it's a long distance, so if our concentration is low, it has to diffuse a long distance. If it's a long distance, the convection will always win. If it's a short distance, then diffusion will tend to always win. If we change our viscosity, we can make diffusion win by reducing convection. So we have very high viscosity, such as in body tissue very often, or in very viscous solutions, we can make diffusion win. 
which incidentally is how your uh, etching that you did in another semester works. Let me draw that for you. So we've got a an electrode that we want to uh, etch polish and we would like to etch polish it using a solution. If we put our solution over here and it is um, some kind of acid it's going to etch this so let's call this zinc and we're going to etch it with our etching solution then it would typically um, etch in and we would have a problem that the solution because of the bubbling will start to move in some direction let's call it this direction and um, because we're bubbling at the surface of our zinc and that will cause convection and so we will preferentially have bubbles and dishing um, and all kinds of problems at our surface but if we control it so that the products can't leave very easily then we slow the reaction right down and we control it by diffusion rather than convection so if I change my solution instead to a phosphoric acid solution which is very viscous or just add a lot of glycerol to my acid we have to be a bit careful if it's an oxidizing acid if we add glycerol to it we're in danger of causing an accident but uh, it is often used we can certainly add a normal mineral acid or phosphoric acid for example to glycerol to increase its viscosity and that will mean that when we make zinc 2 plus ions in solution that will obviously make this area here less likely to dissolve because the concentration of zinc 2 plus goes up and so that's good. If we look at a crevice in our zinc, so let's put two artificial towers on there. In the crevice we get lots and lots of zinc ions and that will make it slow down which is good because we want our crevice to dissolve faster to drill a hole right through our zinc. That's what tends to happen in a bad way we want it to flatten out obviously this corner here which is now exposed to the solution is better because the ions the zinc ions created can diffuse out in all these directions whereas in here they can't because there's another wall and so it's also generating zinc ions so if we increase the viscosity we can naturally promote our zinc to etch flatter it will etch polish itself. That's the opposite of many of the etching solutions that you will have been thinking about in metallic materials where the idea will have been to have deliberately etched some grains more than others or etched them in a way that they generate visible patterns. This is etch polishing where we want anything that sticks out to etch more and anything that sticks in to not etch at all and we are going to take quite a lot off our surface so that we then end up with a flat mirror. Typically we would polish it mechanically beforehand and then edge polish it as the last step. This is obviously the equivalent here. If we are interested in diffusion we want diffusion to win. If we're interested in convection we want convection to win. The problem with convection in a normal case, so if I do just do this experiment with a wire in a beaker then our, most of my current will come from convection and that is a problem it's a problem because convection is kind of random if it's warm on the bottom we'll get a convection current in there cycling this way if I put my electrode in the middle it will be different to if it's here at the third away from the side and it will be different than if it's here near the, the edge because here it would be going down, here it should be going up and here it might be stationary and we've just got going across in the middle. It depends on how many little um, cells they're called of convection are generated so how many little circulating cycles of like whirlwinds of convection are generated and how fast they are and a lot about randomness. Then we would tend to get current goes up and down with time and that's not very good if we're trying to measure something. So very often we deliberately force convection by stirring in order to make that go away. Or we do something else to make diffusion win. The obvious thing to do 
Well, that was the unobvious thing to do to make diffusion win is to make our electrode really, really, really tiny. If we make our electrode really tiny, then we only have one position where things are coming in and then we don't end up with anything colliding. The convection is particularly effective if we are if things are colliding because if we are using stuff up out of solution, let's have it that way around, if we're using stuff up out of solution, just to have the opposite way around to this, then if it's if we've got a convection current that's going up, once it's used up it can't get used up again, so there's nothing going up here, so our current is comparatively low. If we've got a current across, we'll get a very high current, and so we will tend to see variations. If we have a very, very tiny electrode, there is nothing to interfere with it. It will always have a spherical diffusion cell, shell, sorry, and the distance when the electrode where we can use up material is much lower, whereas if we have a huge electrode, we can use a, we can draw a lot of current and we can empty our solution near it of um, active species that we're trying to use up. We can empty it relatively quickly and then convection will be a danger. So making the electrode very, very small is a way of doing it. Let's have a look at a different way. Okay, so let's imagine our electrode to be a stick of something that's conducting and it's coated with a layer of something that isn't conducting. That's important because we want to be able to define the area of the electrode and make it simple. So we would like a circular area of our electrode that interacts with the solution and the sides don't, then it doesn't matter how far we dip it into our solution, nothing new will happen. Let's just color that in blue so that that's obvious. So this is conducting and the outside bit is some polymer probably. If we dip that into solution, we would have interaction just at this point, and we would get convection and all kinds of problems. Also, if we made any bubbles, they would hang around here. That's no good. So what we should do now is rotate this electrode. If we rotate this electrode on this axis, spin it round round, then first of all, it won't look any different the whole time because we're looking at a slice. But if we have a piece of water here, it will get accelerated, or let's have it further out, it will get accelerated in a tangential direction by the rotating electrode, so it will go in this direction. That will make the rest of the solution go faster, and it will generate a low pressure zone in the middle here, so it effectively pumps solution up. This isn't the only way to do this but it turns out to have a very beautiful mathematical solution. The beautiful mathematical solution is that every point on our electrode has the same amount of liquid flowing over it, has the same um, convection, artificial convection pumping over it. That is not the case if we just shoot water at a surface then the middle is different to the outside. We've got um, faster moving liquid in some places, slower moving liquid in other places because it's going out and out. But here, as we go out further, we're accelerating it more because our acceleration force is omega, the rotation rate, multiplied by r, the radius, the distance from the center. So we've got no acceleration force in the middle, so it's really drawn in the middle by stuff moving out it's barely moving at all, but this liquid is then going to get used up as it goes over the surface, so it needs to go faster and faster, and the area of the electrode is going up and up as we go further and further out, and it falls out very nicely, by, by chance really, but obviously people tried different geometries until they got one that was comparatively simple. This one works mathematically simply in that the rate of diffusion or the the thickness of the layer that has to be diffused across the the, the boundary layer, the, the amount that is moving with the electrode is dependent on the speed. And it's the same all the way across the electrode and if we do anything else out here with more electrodes it's also the same on them. 
that's excellent because then we don't have to worry about complicated things. We can of course use our systems, we can stir it in a pot. The problem with stirring in a pot is, as you will have seen in chemistry labs, it's very difficult to get stirring to be constant. Likewise, we can pass it through a tube, that works really well. We can have a ring electrode that works brilliantly. But if we extend the length of our electrode, we end up with all kinds of problems with the surface at the end of the tube being different to the surface at the beginning of the tube because the liquid has passed over already. So it's not ideal. This is a strangely ideal situation and it works really well. But obviously we need to be able to rotate our electrode and it hasn't, uh, it's become less popular recently. However, I've got one and we can have a look and see it working. Um, I haven't finished making an electrode yet, so we won't be able to use it probably unless I get a move on and fix it. Okay, so I've just written a quick table to try to recap why we want to know both the voltage and the current and why getting rid of some of the issues that interfere with these two things make it useful make it more useful because then we can isolate single um, controlling factors let's call it that so if we look at voltage the voltage is a thermodynamic um, entity it tells us whether a process will run or not or whether it is thermodynamically likely to happen it tells us about the energy that we will get out so if we have a high voltage we'll get more energy out which is obvious really because the energy is the volts times um, current if we um, use it for similar materials so if we have a row of materials that are similar but not quite the same we can rank them in order of thermodynamic stability which enables us to know if we connect them together which one will dissolve and which ones will be protected by the other ones and it will also allow us to guess which other processes will be important so from our poor by diagram if we are on the wrong side of the water degradation we know that we can't save in water thermodynamically it's going to make hydrogen if we're in between that and oxygen we know that if we keep it anaerobic so if it's inside parts of the body that aren't very aerobic or it's inside a lake at the bottom where there isn't very much oxygen or underground then it won't happen pro probably on its own if oxygen is applied or bleach or something an oxidizing agent of some kind then it will start and we can predict which ones will be able to do that and which ones won't or what concentration of oxygen will be required to set it off. Current is more about kinetics, so if we were looking at a normal reaction we would think of the current as the kinetics of the reaction and the voltage as the thermodynamics of the reaction, which is obviously concerned with an energy barrier, but there's also energy barriers in here because we can also have a permanent energy barrier that shifts our thermodynamics. Um, we might talk about that soon. Obviously, if we make our electrode bigger, then we will be able to draw more current. So it tells us something about the size, but only if we know all of the other things. It tells us about the concentration in solution because that tells us, or well, because that controls the rate um, if we're using it all up. Um, it's the rate of the reaction, or if we're causing, if we're measuring a corrosion process, it's the rate of corrosion will be related to the current that flows. Welcome back to Applied Materials and Corrosion. Now talking about different types of corrosion that could possibly occur. So if we imagine our piece of metal here and we imagine a layer by layer corrosion over the whole area of the piece of metal, that's relatively benign and typically if we're going to um, see something corroding like that, it's going to corrode in micrometers per year. That would be a normal corrosion rate for zinc for example. It's going to take very long time for something to corrode away at that rate although thermodynamically we know it's going to eventually be destroyed but thermodynamics assumes that it's going to take forever or it assumes that it has forever and therefore um, it might... It, whoops. Sorry I just put my 
light back on. Uh, so thermodynamically, we it doesn't matter how long it's going to take effectively. Practically, it is obviously far more important whether it takes a long time or whether it takes a very short time. Also of importance is whether the corrosion is evenly um, evenly over the whole surface of the material or whether it's local. So if we take the first couple of types of corrosion we can imagine two different metals. It's the simplest type of corrosion that we can imagine. And we can look at a video that I've put on this course last time where I took a piece of platinum and a piece of tin. Tin is above yeah, tin is above the hydrogen line as long as it's slightly acidic so if we take acid and we put tin in we would expect it to dissolve forming hydrogen but it doesn't because there's a high over potential because there is a high energy barrier to hydrogen formation on tin however the energy barrier for hydrogen formation on platinum is very low so if we connect platinum to tin whether it's directly or whether it's with a wire which is what I did it will cause the tin to corrode very quickly and hydrogen will form a platinum likewise my fence in my garden is really badly designed it's got zinc plated steel which is pretty good as we noticed but it's connected together with stainless steel bolts the stainless steel bolts can allow oxygen to be reduced on their surface but they don't corrode and so the corrosion, the um, oxidation reaction, occurs faster in the region around the bolt and that's bad because it will eventually corrode away. If we take a different version, so if we take the plates of metal and we imagine there's a crack between them, if we start off immediately to start with, with general corrosion, so we'll look at, we've got our plate dissolving, maybe it's iron, maybe it's zinc is dissolving so it is turning into Zn2 plus or Fe3 plus ions and that is dumping electrons into the metal then the electrons need to go somewhere otherwise it will stop reacting and the electrons typically go into oxygen and cause it to be reduced to hydroxide species if that occurs all over the surface then it's general corrosion and that is okay um, we can calculate in engineers can calculate in we're probably not in the business of doing that but engineers can do calculations to see that it will last a certain amount of time and it's not too bad but if we have a crack like this so a, an overlap joint between two parts maybe there's a bolt in here maybe it's underneath the head of a bolt maybe it's an, uh, a bond oops, maybe it's a joint where one panel is bent like this and the other one is on the other side in the other direction and they grip into each other like we have in many appliances so your fridge maybe um, toaster that kind of item they will have painted steel which is wrapped around each other and a machine pinches it up like that that's fine in the dry but in the wet some water gets trapped in here and we have the problem that we had last time in our electro polishing we were using it last time because the materials that in that case it was metal lines can't diffuse out very quickly from a small pinch then their concentration goes up and so the rate of corrosion goes down inside that pinch here we've got oxygen getting used up inside the hole and that will cause one of two things so if the oxygen gets used up inside the hole that will make the area inside the hole different to the area outside the oxygen will get used up and um, so it won't be being reduced here and the oxygen will be being reduced on the outside but the metal can be oxidized all over and it turns out that uh, oxygen being reduced generates hydroxide ions metals dissolving generates metal ions, and so we end up with metal hydroxides typically but if we run out of the ability to make new hydroxide ions it means that this gap can become acidic and depending on the metal it can then corrode faster 
that's obviously very sucky if it's underneath the head of a screw some kind of fastener or bolt or something which is what is supposed to have happened on the Titanic with rivets, riveted plates on top of each other have this as a known problem you have to be careful about what type of metal you use in here and um, not generate a, an anaerobic area where it can go acidic but zinc does this on its own if we start to make a little pit in our surface and it becomes anoxic that becomes more um, yeah, lower in pH because here we're generating OH- the whole time and here we are generating not OH- we're generating Z2 plus and as we look on our poor by diagram we can see that if it's acidic our zinc will stay dissolved and so a hole doesn't get plugged up it might get plugged at the outside but it's unlikely to get filled up at the bottom where it's acidic and so the zinc ions will move out and the oxidation uh, or sorry the reduction of oxygen will happen on the outside the oxidation of zinc happens at the bottom of the pit and that's obviously bad because then we will tend to make a hole all the way through our zinc and instead of corroding at a rate of micrometers per year it's all focused on a few points and we'll tend to get through it very quickly indeed so if we change the mode of corrosion we are likely to generate a problem two other types of corrosion that are normally mentioned at this point are stress corrosion where we have a stress and some kind of environment that's causing corrosion and they interact with each other to make it worse and also erosion corrosion where we have some kind of abrasion and also corrosion and they interact with each other to make it worse the, the stress corrosion divides into two cases so we can have normal corrosion where the material is corroding anyway and we can have embrittlement corrosion where the hydrogen that we produce for example on our tin diffuses into the metal and makes it more brittle and that causes the crack to grow so it's really an effect of um, the embrittlement due to the hydrogen which is formed by reduction as the metal dissolves this is a particular problem for us in the biomaterials area in magnesium for example magnesium is a material that can be used as a sacrificial material inside the body it will corrode away fairly quickly inside the salty human container and the magnesium salts that are made are not particularly hazardous so we will pee them out in the usual process so that is good the problem is that as the corrosion proceeds hydrogen diffuses into the metal it also is released inside the body and that can cause pain but the hydrogen diffusing into the metal tends to make it brittle whereas magnesium when it's pure is quite ductile and so we have a change in properties of the metal of the part that we've got inside and that can often cause to fail before it is supposed to what I'm more interested in however at this point is what happened with the coating so if we look at a painted piece of metal we would imagine it as some paint on some kind of uh, inorganic material which would be probably an oxide but it could be a carbonate or something like that maybe a phosphate if we deliberately changed it and then we would have our metal underneath the metal thermodynamically should become metal ions but it can't because there's an organic paint on the top or maybe an inorganic paint we'll consider it as an organic paint first of all what we can think of is all of the possibilities so if we take uh, I've run out of colors if we take oxygen the oxygen can go through the paint it probably can't get through the oxide very easily and it can also get into what we'll call the defect a hole in the paint let's have some water on there so we've got a, a, some water on there our metal can dissolve out here maybe it could also try to dissolve out here uh, it's unlikely to dissolve far away from the defect because obviously there's no reason for it to do so what about water 
Well, water is also able to diffuse through the um, layer to a certain extent. There isn't a huge amount of it at the interface. There will be a small amount unless the paint is... Um, yeah, uh, there will eventually be a small amount, put it that way. So if we leave it long enough, there will be some water and some oxygen there, but it isn't a huge rate. That's, um, yeah, so that's our setup, which means we can go either way. So depending on the conditions, we can have both things happen. So let's do it in both directions, mate. No, let's do it twice. Uh, it's probably horribly confusing otherwise, so I'll draw another one over there. So if we consider this side to be the oxygen sufficient side, we've got enough oxygen on the inside of here and we've got more metal dissolving in the defect than we would like, then we've, we've effectively pushed the corrosion to here, which is fine, we don't mind that happening too much, but then we are going to generate electrons, the colour of my electrons going to be red maybe, we're going to generate electrons in here and our electrons are going to react with oxygen all over. So this is an electron that's going to react with an oxygen and some water at this point. So now we've got O2 plus H2O plus electrons and we will end up with hydroxy radicals. OH dot or peroxide and those are going to cause problems. So what those are going to do is they're going to interfere with the bonding between the paint and our inorganic layer. Of course that is only relevant if the electrons can get through in this direction. They've got to get through this inorganic layer in this direction and they might not be able to and at which point this type of corrosion or this type of breaking because it's not really corrosion it's delamination but the corrosion is happening over here but the problem is actually the reduced oxygen is attacking our paint and causing it to debond so it's called cathodic delamination cathodic because it's the cathode where the electrons go uh, it's horrible old style um, word usage because uh, yeah, it's very confusing. If we think of it the other way around however, so if our oxygen is coming in here and we've got lots of metal coding here, we can have a different process. So if we imagine our metal oxide to be resistant to electrons going through it, then we can have a different process where the corrosion products jack the um, paint off the surface so it corrodes under here instead where water gets down this crack and so we have much more corrosion up here and the oxygen has uh, very little access and then we have the same thing that we had before with the uh, crevice corrosion and pitting that the lack of oxygen causes an acidic region to form here and that will make more metal dissolve and the basic region is here. In our cathodic process this part is actually acidic because more metal is dissolving than oxygen is being reduced. We've got an unbalanced reaction so this piece goes acidic and the piece underneath the paint is actually basic because we're making OH minus ions eventually when they manage to capture another electron. So we are making things that are going to destroy our paint and here we are destroying the paint physically and pushing it off with corrosion products from our metal. This type typically happens on aluminium and the reason for that is that aluminium only has one oxidation state, aluminium 2 plus, and so it's very difficult for electrons to get through the aluminium oxide, a very good insulator. This process very often happens on zinc and the reason for that is because zinc oxide, ZNO, is a reasonably good insulator, but it's also a pretty good semiconductor. And it's doped 
with a zinc 1 and it's doped with extra zinc interstills and they can come from this electron coming in and um, reducing some zinc inside the, um, the dioxide layer making it more conductive. Effectively the process of pushing electrons into it is making the resistance of the zinc oxide less it's making it more conductive and that's obviously really bad and unfortunate for this process because it then causes the um, electrons to get through and reduce oxygen and then the whole process carries on better than it otherwise would. It is particularly uh, susceptible to this and uh, obviously one critical component for that would be car paint. Aluminium is much more susceptible to this, it's very slow however um, and it's a, a problem because it's, get, it's deeper. This goes further, so if we have a scratch in our car body we would expect the paint to fall off to a distance away from the scratch if we don't do anything to it in a reasonably short time because there's always a little bit of water or when it rains a bit of water gets on your vehicle and it causes this type of corrosion and then or type of delamination and then the bonding between the paint and the car body is broken and then you really should cut it back and start again. Here um, this is much more in really bad environments because we're deliberately using aluminium which is quite tough and has a good oxide layer um, so we're exposing it to a relatively rough environment painted aluminium is pretty good but obviously if we hit it hard enough and if it's damaged then things will happen and if you can't go this way around then it goes the other way around. So now I will uh, take you to some kind of demonstration. We'll do three electrode electrochemistry. If I can get the rotating disc working we'll do that and I will show you some cathodic delamination. It's difficult to show you the anodic de delamination because it takes a long time and it uh, uh, it's tricky to get the conditions exactly right so I won't do that um, unless there's one in the salt spray. So we'll try a cathodic delamination because I know that works. Uh, I've, I've got some paint which is really terrible which is obviously good for this particular application because then it falls off easily. What is interesting about it is that it reminds us how poor a resistor to oxygen polymers are. Oxygen typically goes through polymers pretty fast and that even though polymers are pretty good against water a little bit of water vapour makes it through eventually and will get to the other side even in a very good a very resistant polymer like epoxy a small amount of moisture will make it to the surface eventually and it's pretty much impossible to prevent that from happening so it is better from the point of view of designing processes it is better to block it in different ways. The traditional way to prevent cathodic delamination or cathodic delamination is to have a chromium salt because the chromium salt became reduced in the region where the oxygen will be reduced and blocked it instead and the other end became oxidized and that was very handy. These days we can't do that we have to use other processes and so because, um, because of the toxicity of chrome 6 by the way and so we have other solutions not as good but they are not as toxic either and vehicles tend to last long enough anyway unless we happen to be close to the coast or they spray a lot of salt on the road in which case they we will, will be corroded pretty much whatever we do. Mm.